Hello everyone. Welcome to the Euro webinar organized by the European School of Urology. The, web the webinar is scheduled for about 40 minutes. And uh, after that, there will be 15 to 20 minutes for answering the question and the questions can be asked through the question portal. You have one CME credit on completion of the questionnaire after attending the webinar. I am Professor Baskar Somani. I'm based in Southampton and I have been associated with various EU activities for quite some time now. These are my relevant conflict of interest. Let me take you through a journey. So ureteroscopy, PCNL, shockwave lithotripsy, and all aspects of urolithiasis intervention, simulation, etc., has seen a big surge in the publication trend over the last two decades. In fact, the publications have almost quadrupled uh, over the last 20 years or so. And this is specifically so for ureteroscopy and the minimally invasive PCNL. So you can see shockwave lithotripsy is kind of static, but ureteroscopy has seen almost a fourfold increase. When you look at the worldwide trends for intervention, ureteroscopy is on the up, you can see, and has been going up in almost all parts of the world, whereas shockwave lithotripsy is mostly on the decline most of the places. So let's talk about uh, this previous webinar that was done. Our webinar today is a continuation of this. So we've already covered some of the tips and tricks and techniques and instrumentation. I'm not going to go through them today and we will go through how the limits have now expanded or shall we say it's become limitless. So the, the increasing indications now are there for large stones, specific circumstances such as uh, you know, which have broadened the indications and we'll come to them. Upper tract TCC diagnosis and uh, treatment, which is again on the rise, and endopilotomy. When you look at specific circumstances, we have all kinds of conditions from obesity, coagulopathy, foreign bodies, abnormal anatomy, and uh, large stones, urinary diversion, pediatric patients, pregnancy, and so on. The list is endless. When we talk about the EAU guidelines for uh, stones and ureteroscopy, ureteroscopy is the first line for proximal stone larger than 10, 10 millimeters and for all renal stones under two centimeter, again, ureteroscopy is the first line. Even for lower pool stones, irrespective of the anatomy, ureteroscopy is still the first line for under two centimeters. So there's a a broad representation of ureteroscopy is the first line, apart from very large stones. When we look at the, the stone size and the cutoff, this is a paper from about eight years ago, where at the time, one centimeter or one and a half centimeter was considered as large. And this systematic review showed over nine studies that for stones which are bigger than two centimeters, the stone tree rate was 94%, although some patients would need between one and two procedures. So you have to counsel and warn the patients about the need for a second procedure. The operative time was 82 minutes and the complications were 10% of which five were major complications. Fast forward it to this year, and this was a paper recently published by uh, Prof Traxer, and this is looking at staghorn stones. Now there are five studies in this review Stone tree rates were similar, but the number of procedures needed varied between two and four. So patients do need multiple procedures if you're going to use ureteroscopy. So although it is feasible, it is probably to be reserved in really unfit or obese patients where PCNL is not uh, recommended or can't be done. And for me, for Sagon stones, treatment is still PCNL, except in extreme cases where you can't perform a PCNL. Looking at our own series from three years ago for large stones, we had 43 patients with a mean stone size of almost three centimeters. Stone tree rate achieved was 84%. And again, some patients needed a second procedure for being stone tree. Complication rates were minor and they were related to urinary infections. We then looked at all published literature at the time for more than two centimeters. An access sheet was used in almost all papers, or at least three quarters of all patients, and the average number of procedures for this size of stone was between 1.1 to 1.8. So 
up to two procedures were needed for being stone free for stones that were almost three centimeters. So clearly PCNL could be the first choice, but staged ureteroscopy would probably be up there now considering ureteroscopy is relatively safe. This has pushed the limits even further. This is our study from the last 18 months. And we look at the role of dusting and pop dusting using high powered laser. And in this study, which was done across uh, with a minimum stone size of 15 millimeters, we had 50 uh, patients and 55 renal units. The minimum size was 15 millimeter. Laser setting, we start with dusting and then go to pop dusting. Mean cumulative diameter, just over two millimeter. Op time, just a shade over 50 minutes compared to eight years ago when the op time was almost 80 to 85 minutes. Op time has been shaved significantly. Excess sheet was used in almost two thirds of patients. And the stone free rate, initial and final stone free rate, extremely uh, high. And the patients, most of them are stone free with one procedure. Very few needed a second procedure. So I think using dusting and pop dusting technique, you get excellent stone free rate, and possibly this sets a new benchmark for large, multiple, or bilateral stones. So just to show you what dusting and pop dusting would mean, uh, in this video, you look at initial dusting, and I always start with dusting. You start with a, a, you know energy of 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 frequency of uh, 30 to 50 hertz. You taste the stone, you start and keep dusting till the stone will dust and I don't change the setting but very often after you've done the initial outer shell dusting you then get the, the hard inner core and at the time the dusting doesn't work anymore or it doesn't it's not as effective then you change to pop dusting which you can see here and all you do is increase the energy setting to 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 and by using this the, the there's a whirlpool effect with pop dusting the stones come towards you and you can really achieve fine, very fine fragments and, and dust. So I think dusting and pop dusting now is a new benchmark, especially for large stones. So I use an access sheet, especially within a calyx, it works really well because the stones have nowhere to go and the, the laser with this setting, with the pop dusting works extremely well. So I think this, again, you decrease the operative time significantly and at the end, what you're left with, is uh, as I said, tiny fragments and, and dust which should pass alongside. I do leave a stand for these to help uh, the fragments pass out. Going forward, what about low pool calicell anatomy? This is a, a paper from last year. We always talk about shock wave lithotripsy and infundible pelvic angle, but what about ureteroscopy? In this paper, we looked at 108 patients from our data who had collected prospectively. The stone free rate was quite good, almost 95%. But we also looked at the literature review on what was uh, in the, out there in the literature. So this is our non-stone free and stone free comparison. The significant factors for not stone free were the infundible pelvic angle, the stone size and the operative time. And, and when we looked at the literature, again, the infundible pelvic angle was probably the most significant, the infundible length and width, not so much. So in conclusion to this, in front of the pelvic angle under 30 degrees significantly increases the risk of uh, not clearing the stone. So in these cases, you might want a different alternate way of treatment such as a PCNL. Looking at morbidly obese and obese patients, this is a review including 15 studies with over 800 patients. A mean BMI of 40.5, the mean stone size, again, about 1.4 centimeter, which is similar in both groups. The key point here to note is the stone tree rate was significantly higher in the obese compared to the morbidly obese, and the complication rates were almost double in morbidly obese patients compared to the obese. So although you can perform stone surgery, there is a higher risk. Although most were minor complications, still there is a higher risk in the morbidly obese patients. Similarly, this is a CRO study looking at BMI. We, we all know it's 12,000 patients. 17.5% of the cohort was obese and 2.5% were super obese. And higher BMI was associated with lower stone free rate, with higher retreatment rate, and in the super obese, also with higher rate of complications. So although ureteroscopy can be performed safely, the risk of usually minor complications is higher. 
moving on to patients with bleeding diathesis, anticoagulation, or antiplatelet agents. In this review, there were eight studies with almost uh, 1,100 patients. 90% were stone-free, and between the two groups, the normal group and the anticoagulated group, or the, the group with bleeding diathesis, stone-free rate and the thrombotic complications were equivalent, but the bleeding complications were significantly higher in the anticoagulated or the diathesis group. So you do have to have a patient-centered approach, individualized approach for, for these patients. And I would normally, if you can correct the bleeding diathesis or stop the antiplatelet, then I would do that. If it can't be done, then you have to still warn them that the complications related to bleeding, as shown in the meta-analysis, are higher. Going forward, what about stones in solitary kidney? This was a large systematic review looking at all three modalities of which electroscopy specific were 15 studies. Stone size was a mixture between 10 and 28 millimeter. Op time again varied for stone size, but up to two hours. Stone through rate was variable and some patients needed a second procedure. Complications mostly minor by 15%. But the important point here is renal function deterioration was only seen in one of the 15 studies. And in eight studies, it got better, and in two, it stayed the same. So actually, electroscopy in solitary kidney, you know, the effect on renal function is usually positive. When you look at the complication rates, mostly it was Clavian 1 related to fever or transient increase in creatinine. A very few had Clavian 3 or 4. And the conclusion from this was electroscopy for solitary kidney has increased. An intervention needs to be balanced with a few things such as safety profile, renal function, invasiveness of the procedure, and the need for ancillary procedures. So if you were to choose between the three different treatment modalities, that's what you have to keep in mind. Going forward, bilateral electroscopy, again, it is increasingly being performed. This year we had 16 studies. The mean op time was 75 minutes, and the stone true rate was reasonably high. Minor complication rates, again, higher than what you'd expect for unilateral surgery, and major complications were quite low at 1.4%. So looking at comparison of bilateral urethroscopy to staged or unilateral procedure. So if you compare bilateral to unilateral or staged, the overall complications were higher with bilateral. However, when you consider them as renal units, so if bilateral is two renal units and unilateral is staged the single renal unit, bilateral had fewer complications. Also, you have to keep in mind these are cases that should be done based on a high volume in the urology center. And overall, there is a reduction in cost, operative time, and hospital stay when you perform bilateral urethroscopy. So arguably, there is an advantage to doing them. Looking at transplant and urethroscopy for stone disease, this is a, a paper with 18 articles where 17 had donor or bench ureteroscopy and 11 had post-transplant ureteroscopy. The pre-transplant ureteroscopy group had 66 patients, 100% stone-free rate. There were some minor complications related to graft dysfunction and occlusion of ureteroneocystotomy. Whereas on the other side, on the post-transplant ureteroscopy, there were 101 patients. Usually they present with the obstruction or renal dysfunction as you would expect. The stone tree rate was variable, and complications are mostly related to UTI, hematuria, or pain. Very few had major complications. So donor or post-transplant ureteroscopy actually is safe and effective. It does increase the donor pool on one side because transplant waiting lists are quite long. So the donor pool is increased by doing that. However, they must be carried out in high-volume centers in conjunction with the renal and transplant team. Treatment of donor stores would, as I said, increase the pool, and bench electroscopy is a good option for some of these prior to uh, donation, because the patients are then stone-free prior to transplant. What about calicyl diverticula? Calicyl diverticula is really hard, and there are very few studies on it with electroscopy or any other modality. However, generally speaking, electroscopy, along with mini PCNL, seems to be the first choice for most urologists especially for stones less than two centimeter. Intraoperative ultrasound can sometimes help with calicyl diverticula. Ureteroscopy needs skill, expertise, and tools that are necessary for this procedure. The problem is heterogeneity of diverticular anatomy, no two diverticular are the same. 
the location and stone burden can sometimes make this treatment very difficult. Treatment has to be again directed to individual patient choice and counseling. This is a technique that uh, Prof. Traxer has popularized, which is the blue spritz technique. If there is a stone in collateral diverticulum, you put methylene blue indigo carmine through ureteric catheter to opacify the pelvic collateral system. In step three, the pelvic collateral system is opacified and the diverticulum takes the contrast and the methylene blue as well. Then you wash the system with uh, saline and expecting the whole of the pelvic collateral system to have been washed out except the diverticulum where you can see a little bit of methylene blue still trickling through letting you get into the diverticulum so showing you the neck of the diverticulum and that's the the technique that uh, has commonly been used i'll show you a video of another technique that we have used where we could get so this is a case that was referred from peripheral hospital the stone diverticulum as you can see from the upper pool and we managed to get an nephrostomy tube going down through the diverticulum and I could then follow a retrograde electroscopy and we managed to then open the neck of the diverticulum retrogradely. So this is another option. If you can get a wire through the diverticulum, you can open the neck of the diverticulum enough for you to, you to then get to the stones and remove the stones. And at the same time on the, the video alongside, uh, you know, you, of course you should try and do a electroscopy over a safety and working wire, which is what we're doing on the right side. You can see on the right side, the video shows a stone buried over a thin mucosal film, and you can actually open the mucosal film with a laser, as you would see now. And once you have opened the mucosal film with a laser, you can then treat the stone. So although it's not a diverticulum, it's a mucosal film, but clearly shockwave lithotripsy is not going to be effective in this, and the electroscopy and laser treatment would work quite nicely. Again, with a diverticular stone, once the, you have removed the stones, and the diverticulum is open, the idea should be to try and leave a stent in the diverticulum so that it is now draining and hopefully it won't close down and won't be a problem in the future. And I think these are quite good tricks to, to use, especially if you're doing your electroscopy. Uh, you could do a PCNL you know, up, from upstart, but I think doing your electroscopy this way, at the end you'll see that uh, on the left side we have removed the, the nephrostomy. So you can remove the nephrostomy, leave a stent to go in that area and the patients can go home. So here you can see me removing the nephrostomy. And once the nephrostomy is removed, the stone is cleared. You can leave the stent going into that area and uh, the patients you know, can go home without the need to stay overnight or without the need to have a nephrostomy. So there you are, the nephrostomy is gone on the left side and the, the stent can just be placed going into that. So I think the diverticular stones are quite challenging. And again, tailored approach have, is, is usually needed in these cases. What about retrograde electroscopy and urinary diversion? Uh, this review looked at six studies with 125 patients. And of course, this was for both diagnosis as well as for treatment. The success rate, not as high as before, but reasonable. Complication rates, again, quite variable. Retrograde approach is feasible. However, I think there should always be a plan and have a low threshold for an anti-grid approach. So when you're going, putting the patient to sleep, you should have a backup of an anti-grid approach. Should this not work? Because it's a real shame to have to finish the procedure and having to bring the patient for a second anesthetic. So I think you should plan them together. Having said that, what are, what are the tips and tricks? Use a flexible cystoscope and urethroscope. So cystoscope can help you negotiate through the quandary. A super stiff bike can help negotiate strictures, access sheet if necessary, and of course you need to have the contrast, etc. An anti-grade approach should always be available as a backup. The complications most commonly seen are hematuria, urinary tract perforation, incomplete tumor removal, and damage to organs. And the challenges generally are associated with strictures, the tortuosity, and anatomical challenges. So these are some things you have to bear in mind when you're doing a retrograde electroscopy. Looking at CKD and kidney stones, again, CKD is an interesting area and people are doing more and more electroscopy for these group of patients. This was our prospective study over six and a half years with 277 patients with CKD two and above. Mostly the stones were in the kidney, but at least 40% were also in the ureter. Stone free rate was high. Complication rates mostly were claimed in one or two. 
Again, importantly, renal function either remains stable or improved in most patients. So patients with CKD actually do quite well uh, with ureteroscopy, and it is a safe treatment option in these patients. We also did a systematic review, and in that, when you look, there were only four studies on ureteroscopy. There were three other studies that compared ureteroscopy to PCNL. The predisposing factors we have to be aware of if there is a pre-existing pre-op renal function, which is quite poor, diabetes and hypertension. These are the patients which have a higher risk of going into renal problems afterwards. Endurological interventions, generally, I would say, do not adversely affect renal function and actually might tend to improve it in some patients. And appropriate counseling is necessary for intervention and follow-up. And I think follow-up bit is also important. And if they are into CKD3 and above, they should probably have a follow-up with the renal team as well in conjunction. What about anomalous kidneys and ureteroscopy? This we had 14 papers. Horseshoe kidney, as you'd expect, was most common, followed by ectopic and pelvic kidney. But the, the, the stone through rate, 90% uh, of these patient groups had ureteroscopy. Stone size was reasonably large, and mean op time was just over an hour. Stone through rate, initially 77%, final stone through rate, 82%. I think we all know the trouble with ureteroscopy is if you're using dusting and haven't cleared it physically, going in and out and clearing the fragments, these can regrow. So I think here, I think more often than not, I use fragmentation and stone retrieval if possible, because that's the only way to really clear sometimes the anatomical challenging kidneys. Complication rates were reasonably high, although most were again cleared in one or two. This is an interesting area, ureteroscopy for stone disease in pregnancy. And uh, we looked at this a few years ago, but what we did was we looked at two time periods. Overall, there were 21 articles and 271 procedures. The time period, time period one was 20 year time period between 1990 and 2010. Time period two was a two year period. And you can see just in the two year between 2010 and 12, there are more pregnancy related ureteroscopy than in the preceding 20 years. And the complication rates, as you'd expect, were, were higher in the second period because I think people were doing and pushing the boundaries. However, there were no maternal or fetal deaths. There were a few premature delivery or preterm labor. Overall complications, again, general complications like electric perforation or UTIs were again common in period two, but overall safety was still maintained. So looking at the guidelines and this paper from ESIT about the practical management aspect in urolithiasis in pregnancy, stent insertion seems to be more effective than conservative management, especially for moderate to severe hydronephrosis. Electroscopy is a reasonable alternative to long-term stent or drainage, and you have to, of course, ask and counsel the patient and take their consent and decision-making. Please be aware of stent incrustation. Urolithiasis needs a multidisciplinary management to achieve good outcomes for mother and baby, and I think that is the key. What about ureteroscopy in pediatric? This is one of the largest ureteroscopy series from, from UK. We had 81 patients with over 100 procedures for pediatric ureteroscopy with a mean age of just under nine years and ranged from one and a half to 16 years. The stone size was 11 and a half uh, millimeters, but it varied from four to 46 millimeter. Access sheet was used in 20%. You'd also see the post-operative stent usage is much relatively less compared to adults. Only 60% had post-operative stent. The initial and final stone free rate was, was good. The final stone free rate was 99%. Some patients did need a second and one needed a third procedure. So again, you have to counsel the patient, but very good. Uh, outcomes were achieved. These are some of the other papers. What about access sheet for pediatric ureteroscopy? Is it safe? What about long-term follow-up? This was one of our papers for 20 patients who had the access sheet and a follow-up of uh, uh, almost 26 months. And the access sheet used was 9.5, 11.5 French. The stone free rate was good, but there was no intra or immediate post-operative or long-term complications or like structure noted. So it shows that although we don't routinely use the pediatrics for large stones, we do use it with uh, good outcomes. Similarly, looking at dusting and pop dusting, like we did in adults, we looked at the pediatric setting. And although there was only a small cohort of 12 patients, 
again, no complications were noted for large stones. So I think this is, again, a good treatment option for large pediatric stones. So what do the guidelines say? For pediatric cases, indications are similar to adults, and ureteroscopy is a feasible op option for less than two centimeter stones. Pregnancy, we treat uh, uncomplicated ureolithiasis conservatively. That should be the first line. But if you need intervention, then you can intervene clinical indication if it's there. Retrograde approach, if it's not possible, anti-grade approach must be considered for unit diversion. And PCNL is still recommended for larger stones. And in terms of urinary, in terms of renal transplant, I think the access can be difficult retrogradely, and uh, you must consider anti-grade approach. Although again, this is in conjunction with the transplant team. In the special procedures, in terms of guidelines, caliceal diverticulum ureteroscopy is one of the first line options. Same with horseshoe kidneys or pelvic kidneys, and in UPG obstruction, you can do ureteroscopy with endopalotomy with a laser. That is also a recognized option. Moving track and going to the upper tract, a urethelial tumor and guidelines associated with it, especially in terms of treatment. You can do that for low risk disease, for unifocal disease, for tumor size less than two centimeters. I know there are recent papers that say it's feasible in more than two, but this is the current guidelines. Proven urethroscopy, low grade non-invasive on CT scan, and then are they A, willing to comply with early look and stringent surveillance? And the, the idea is to complete resect or destruct the tumor. And generally speaking, the recommendation is as a primary treatment for low-risk tumors or patients with imperative indications like solid kidney or impaired renal function. And I'll just share with you a video where we, the, the tumor is in the, uh, you can see, towards the renal pelvis and upper tract. Uh, we did a ureteroscopy and the tumor, it was small and the decision was made to treat it endoscopically. And we did manage to almost inoculate the tumor starting from one end. So rather than fulgurating it, uh, I thought the best way to do that is to try and inoculate it from the side and then try a grasper or a basket to remove the bulk of it. And that's what we did. So you can see here, tumor being uh, ablated And then once the ablation is done, uh, you know, you, you have got, uh, the, the idea here is to use a high power, so one to 1.2 joules and low frequencies, so you have got more control. Uh, again, this is something that you need to take very seriously if you're thinking of uh, endoscopic control because uh, patient counseling is a key. They must know that this is probably uh, still not the gold standard, although with stringent surveillance and follow-up, it is equivalent to gold standard. When you're doing it, you have to be careful about perforation and doing it, you know, bit by bit, taking your time. Uh, you could fulgurate it as well, uh, and that would be another option. Uh, I'm trying to remove it from the base. And at, at one point, I, you know, I tried, I've done enough, and I removed the bulk of it uh, with a basket. And then I went back, and there was a little bit more left behind. And the idea is to try and clear it completely. So that when you have done the procedure, the, you know, at least visually, uh, the tumor is completely gone. Some people want to have an early look. So in probably about six weeks, you can go and have a look. I think in our center, we'll struggle to get them that early. So we have a look usually in between two and three months time frame. And if it is controlled, then a stringent follow-up is applied. So ureteroscopy in three months and then six months, and then based on the CT scan, patient preference, comorbidities, et cetera, we sometimes leave it for six months to one year afterwards. So again, the second part of the, the tumor, we are, we are removing it here. So there are various ways of doing it. I think you should be comfortable doing it and the patient has to be counseled about it. What about laser endopilotomy? As I said, this is another indication. This is a review paper with 20 studies. The success rate with this is quite variable. Mean follow-up, you can argue, is not that long. Primary PEG obstruction, the success rate was about 80%, and with secondary PEG obstruction, about 70%. Complication rates mainly were UTI, and most recurrences did occur within 24 months. So I have to say, uh, longer follow-up would be desirable because the follow-up is quite short, but reasonable success can be achieved. This is just to show where you should be cutting 
So if you have got the cut on the left kidney, it should be about at five o'clock. On the right side, it should be seven o'clock. And if you're doing a ureteric incision, it should be 12 o'clock. And this is to do the vasculature so you don't injure any major vessel. Looking into the future, I think there is an increasing uh, role of access sheath. Complications must be reduced further. And local regional anesthesia with, uh, you know, uh, for your ureteroscopy should probably come in. Uh, and then smaller sized ureteroscopes are also going to make an appearance. New lasers, especially the thulium fiber and the Moses II would have an increasing role to minimize it further. Similarly, minimizing radiation and the risks. So if I was to go a step further, we have looked at the access sheet cross data. It reduced infections. We have looked at our operating time data. It was associated with infection complications. So we recommend, it, we recommend keeping the op time under 90 minutes. Stand dwell time, minimize as much as possible. Ideally, perform a ureteroscopy within one month of having a pre-stent. And antibiotic prophylaxis should be tailored based on local resistance. This is one of our access sheet papers where we had almost 203 patients with a mean stone size of uh, almost 17 millimeters, good stone free rate, and none of the patients had a ureteric injury at the time of surgery. And one of the reasons I always do a semi-rigid ureteroscopy to pre-dilate the ureter, have two wires at the time of ureteroscopy. And if you think the access sheet is not going to go, then don't use it at all. And this way you can really minimize access sheet related uh, complications. What about local regional anesthesia? This is a recent paper from uh, a review with 21 studies. And the overall stone through rate is variable. It's not something I would routinely do. Complication rates are also, there's a wide range. But I think the important thing is people who are unfit, patients, the conversion to GA was quite small. And I think it could be a potential alternative to general anesthetic, especially for distal electric stones. Again, you have to counsel the patients because it probably is not for everyone. And I would say that, you know, you really have to be careful that you choose the right patient for this. What about the role of single use scopes? For me, I think I would leave it for large renal stones, low pulse stones over one and a half centimeter. If there's abnormal anatomy where there's higher risk of, stone, of scope breakages and previous history of urosepsis or multi-resistant culture. What about technological developments in future? What is going to come in? We know the Moses II has come and that again helps with uh, decreasing retropulsion, increasing your frequency uh, or the dusting. Same with thulium fiber laser, there's a lot of buzz around. The clinical studies are awaited, but again, it can go a lot faster. There's a lot of dusting, less retropulsion. And most excited about the 7.5 scopes, I think there are a few companies, I know Pison has already launched. This is a minimally invasive scope and hopefully it can and push the boundaries with min minimization even further. What about the future of ureteroscopy? I think increasingly bigger tumors or multiple tumors can be dealt with ureteroscopy. I've, I've just shown that sing more than two centimeter stone possibly can be done in single session and bigger stones up to three centimeter in stage sessions. It could be a first line treatment for specialized groups like pediatrics and pregnancy. What about future of stone surgery? I think there is still a while to go. We have to standardize the nomenclature. Stone measurements has to be standardized as well. Stone volume versus size. I think increasingly people are going to use volume measurements. What about single versus staged? Is pre-op stent and post-op stent removal counted as you know surgical intervention? In strict sense of the word, it probably is. So that means it's staged. So you have to standardize this nomenclature. Stone rate as well. There's lots of different definitions. And ultimately, we don't know much about intrarenal pressure and temperature, and this is a must for any future soon surgery. So take home message. I think we all agree intrarenal surgery or ureteroscopy is increasing. It can be difficult, uh, but it can be used in all circumstances. New techniques are pushing the boundaries further, and digital and disposable technology, I think, will change the landscape even further. So what are the reasons for expansion then? I think technology is of course driving it. Training, don't forget, we have no simulation protocols and hands-on training. And this means people are trained up quite well. And the guidelines, uh, if you stick to guidelines, the chances of making a mistake or serious mistake or serious complication is less. 
thank you so much for listening. Uh, I really appreciate you joining me today. And I have to thank the European School of Urology and the team in EAU for making this happen. And we will take questions. And the last thing I would say is I think electroscopy knows no limits. Uh, on a serious note, I think, yes, there are some limits, but it can be done in all situations in all kinds of patients. Thank you. So I'm going to now go over to the questions. And uh, uh, there are lots of questions I think I can see, so I'll try and uh, deal with as many as possible. The first question is, how do you personally assess stone tree post-op CTKB for everyone? I have to say, I don't do a CTKB for everyone post-op. I think that will be the gold standard we should be doing. Several reasons for it. A, the availability of CT scan can be sometimes limited. I think the radiation dose is less of an issue and more than more people are doing the ultra low dose CT scan and that should work well. So if your center allows it and if you can get it, then I think that should be the gold standard we should strive to. And stone-free means stone-free, although currently, again, there's a debate, and I think people would say somewhere between, uh, you know, one to two millimeters is stone-free, but if you really take the word of it, it should be stone-free. Okay, next question. Uh, I'm always afraid that dusting material might cause recurrent stones. What do you think? Is there any literature? I think you're right. Naseem, dusting can sometimes, and I think there are studies, especially from US, where they have done the dusting technique and compared to fragmentation, and they've done a CT scan afterwards. And I think the dusting technique wasn't as good as people thought. So after dusting technique, the risk of recurrence was slightly higher. I think that brings to the question of what is dust and how do you define dust? I think increasingly for me, when I started 10 years ago, the dust was probably now I would consider them as small fragments. You know, now I consider dust, which is really dust. So it, it, it depends on how you kind of classify dust. I know that Prof. Trax has shown the dust means it can kind of, you know, under 250 microns or up to that, but it's very difficult to measure it. I think, again, this is not standardized and I agree with you. Uh, that if dust is not really dust, and for me, if you open the fluid irrigation and if it washes nicely and it's really fine, that's what is dust. But I'm sure some people will uh, disagree. I think, yeah, there is always going to be a risk because we are not quite sure where the dust ends and where the slow fragments quite begin. Next question is uh, uh, follow up scheme. And again, I think it relates to you know whether you do contrast. Uh, and whether you would uh, use a DJ. So there are a few questions here that Jacob has asked. I think the follow-up scheme for me, it's variable. I would say if it's a radio opaque stone, very clearly seen on a plain X-ray, I do a plain X-ray. And again, I know it's not perfect, but that's what I do in my real practice. And I do that in six to eight weeks time. If it's a radio lucent stone, and then I would go for an ultrasound scan, sometimes a CT contrast, non-contrast. I generally don't use a, a contrast CT, even in the planning, unless the, the anatomy is complicated. Uh, the leftover dust diameter, as I said, there is no agreement. I think if it's less than one millimeter, for me, that would probably do nicely. Do I leave a DJ stand? I have to say, again, I used to leave a lot more than what I do now. So my post-op stenting rate, I would say probably varies between 70 to 80%. It used to be a lot higher, but I think I'm getting braver by leaving less stents. And this is one thing where if you're really uh, doing big stones, then it's really hard to not leave a stent. I think because there's lots of, even if it's lots of dust that has to kind of come out. Uh, so that's where we are. So I think it should come down. I think we are all guilty of probably leaving more stents than we should. If I've done a large stone with an access sheet, I would, I think, stent. If it's a simple stone in the year two and it went really well, then I probably wouldn't. Uh, do you always treat diverticular stones? What is the harm? That's a very good question, uh, Parity. I, I don't always treat them. The first, the first rule of any surgery is first do no harm. If the patient is asymptomatic and if it was discovered incidentally, I don't see a reason why you should treat them. When I say treat them, I'm in surgical intervention. That doesn't mean you should follow it. Again, it depends on the stone size and location, etc. 
I have to say we have a stone, uh, a virtual stone clinic, which is nurse led. And if I'm happy that the patient is asymptomatic with minimal harm, I would follow them up. So you can say it is a type of treatment, but not surgical intervention. And if I had to do surgical intervention, my first treatment is usually ureteroscopy if I'm suspecting a stone in a diverticulum because you can delineate the diverticulum only if that doesn't work or if I can't find the diverticulum, then I'd go for another form of treatment like a PCNL. Uh, next question is from Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Do you ever use pre-op stenting in all cases of ureteroscopy? I don't actually. In fact, we have published it. I use pre-op stenting somewhere between, and this is not me personally, in our unit because when the patient comes in actively or acutely, uh, different people are on call. And if it's a non-endurologist, if they're stented, that's how I inherit these patients who are pre-stented. In our series of uretanic stones, 30% were pre-stented. Most were not. If I'm doing a, a routine ureteroscopy, I would pre-stent. And probably in three to 5% of cases, maybe up to 7%, you would need to pre-stent because the ureter was tight. In most cases, you don't have to. Lynn, again, same from you. I'd like to know the timing of intervention in pregnant women. Gosh, try not to intervene if you can. Uh, if you must intervene, conservative treatment, if it has failed, then the minimal intervention probably would be in form of uh, stent first. If uh, you discuss with the patient and if they are really in the f in, in the first trimester, I think you have there are some do's and don'ts. I think in the first trimester, uh, I, I would probably try and do fluoroless if possible. Uh, in the third trimester, the as as the the baby is there and the ureteric anatomy is slightly more distorted, but the ureter is actually quite wide usually. So there is no real timing. If you must do it, only then intervene. And if it can be minimized with just a stent, arguably it will need to be then changed, but at least you don't have to then do your retroscopy. But I think this is where counseling the patient, taking help with obstetricians, with midwives, with radiologists. So in our hospital, they do the ultrasound scan, et cetera, becomes really important. It really is a teamwork in such cases. This is a question from Max. Thanks, Max. Uh, it's a good friend of mine. What kind of laser setting do you use for treatment of low risk? So Max, I generally try and keep the, the frequency low so that it is more in control and I can use it like, you know, in a controlled incising kind of way, like the video I showed where I incised it from the, from the electric wall. And I tend to have a slightly higher power, so about 1 to 1.2. So the idea is to try and cut it or ablate it. Uh, again, Max, the next question in the same uh, frame, what is the experience of using chemo installation of kidney via MonoJ? So we've actually published this, uh, not from Southampton, but when I was working in Dundee in Scotland of uh, using post-op mitomycin C, using a urinary catheter, same regime as a bladder. And we did use it uh, afterwards. I think the evidence is still lacking in this, if I'm really honest. I don't, in my current practice, do it. We did it when I was there, when I was training, and I think the risk of ureteric stenosis is, is, is something you have to watch out. And it is not something I would routinely do. And again, if you are a big center doing a lot of endo-urological treatment for upper tract TCC, maybe this is something you need to watch out and you need to do it in terms of prospective or multicentric study. I don't routinely do chemo installation in my current practice. Are making uh, uh, increasing the stone tree rate and time limit. Uh, my time limit uh, is probably under one hour for most cases, one and a half hours max. Very rarely I'll go beyond that if I want to avoid a second anesthetic and it's a high risk patient. So up to one hour is absolutely fine. If it comes to a push, push it to one and a half hours. If you really were to go beyond that, uh, then you have to have a very good reason why you are going to do it. Otherwise, stage it. I think that's better. And the same thing with bilateral, I always tell the patients, I never promise that I'll do both sides. I'll start with one side. If it goes well and two time only, then I'll go to the other side. And they know that. And I'd usually start with the side that I need to do most. So if it's a ureteric stone, that's where I'll start. If it's a renal stone on the other side, that can wait. But if I can do both sides, I will. 
Next question, do you perform fragment extraction or complete extraction? To be honest, I quite like fragment extraction and I know people say dust and then come out. If it's a hard stone, dusting can be really difficult sometimes because you have fragments inevitably. And as I said, I use access sheet and I quite like to go and grab and remove the access sheet, remove the stones. If it's a big stone, of course, it's a problem. You can't keep doing it. And that's where I use pop dusting. But if let's say it's a five millimeter to 10 millimeter stone, you can break it nicely into four or five or six bits and you can just remove it. And for me, stone free is then stone free. So I quite like doing it, the fragment extraction in such cases. When you use direct access to the unit without access sheet, do you insert a guide wire first? Uh, thanks, Marco. Uh, as some of you might know, I'm also the coordinator for the Europe hands on training. A safety wire is a must. And I know I can do wireless and it's no problem, but for me, say safety wire always should be used along with the working wire. And hence, I would always use an access sheet with an adjacent wire, which is as a safety. And the access sheet goes over the working wire. Next question is from Sachin. Uh, thanks, Sachin. Even when stents with calicyl diverticulum, they often close in six months, one year. Are there any other options? You are right, Sachin. They do tend to close up. People have tried fulgurating it. I have to say, I don't routinely do it. I mean, the, the video I so, showed, I opened the diverticulum. I try and open it quite wide. And if it's quite wide, they tend not to close up. But I completely agree. It can be difficult. And I don't know if there is any right or wrong answer. You probably each diverticulum will have to be dealt with on its own. If it closes down and if there's a recurrent stone, then probably you have to do it again or you have to try some other trick. But I agree, it can sometimes close down. Any role of pre-op alpha block of offers? Thanks, Rusty. I don't use it routinely. And I know there are some studies that show that uh, they can pre-dilate the heteroscopy. It's not something I do in a routine practice, I have to say, because I think if you do it and if you can just use a, a, a semi-rigid electroscopy prior to doing a flexi, it kind of dilates nicely. Uh, yeah, uh, not in my practice, but I know some people do and you, you can use it. I don't think there is harm, any harm in using it, provided again, you tell the patient about alpha blocker and that it's not you know, a clinical recommended use. This is from Roberto. I generally prefer dusting procedure with a 35 watt laser. Do you think there is a rationale for stone dimension between dusting and probe corning? I think Roberto, to be honest, uh, if it's getting dusted and if it's a soft stone, I would probably just carry on. I wouldn't change at all. Why change it? If it's dusting well, I would just carry on dusting. You know, in my view, you don't have to then change it. If the inner core is hard, that's when I would change to pop dusting. Uh, the next question is, where is the real time limit amongst lithotripsy and electroscopy, especially in centers where there is no electroscopy? I think you're absolutely right, Marianne. The first rule is to look at what tools you have and use them well. So if your center doesn't have electroscopy and it has lithotripsy, use lithotripsy. I don't think, uh, you know, when we talk about pushing boundaries and doing a PCNL or lithotripsy, Whatever you can do best, give the patient your best treatment. If you can offer all three, fine. If you can offer one, which is very good, offer that one. Absolutely. Andreas Kolaikos, thank you for listening, Andreas. Uh, which type of instrument should I buy? Uh, Q1. Uh, I'm, I think this probably relates, Andreas, as I'm suspecting, to the laser. Uh, I don't know, Andreas, which type of instrument uh, should I buy in terms of lasers. I think thulium fiber laser, from what I've seen in the, the, the lab studies, it looks quite good. The Moses II looks quite good. You have to ask yourself, do you need a Ferrari to go from place A to place B? If you can afford it, of course, I want a Ferrari. For most simple stones, you don't need a, a big laser, but I think with big lasers, even though they're expensive, you do push the limits and you can do bigger stones in one setting. So if you can afford them and you can justify them by pushing the boundaries. So we have shown in our study, more than two centimeter stone using pop dusting and dusting with a 100 watt uh, standard uh, homium laser 
we could achieve in one setting. So I think it's what you can afford. It what the center allows you to. Uh, so I think if I can afford it, of course, I want the best. That doesn't mean you should always go for the best. If a simple thing does it, then so be it. Uh, you have a troscope during pregnancy. What is the, with the presence of gynecologist uh, query? I don't think they need to be in the operating room, uh, Simon. I think they need to be aware that if there's a patient who is going for your troscopy, if they have preterm labor, then they, there is help and hand from your side. Because as urologists, I mean, I'll be scared if they go into labor. So they should be aware that this is happening. I don't think they need to be in the operating room. And it should be discussed, and the patient should have had a chance to discuss that. Next question from Gagan. Thanks, Gagan. If a stone is within the calyx in a diverticulum, how do you gain access to the scope of the urethroscope? Again, I've shown the, the blue spritz technique that Olivier Traxer has shown about how you can put some, uh, some methylene blue and then wash that with saline, and then hopefully the diverticulum would be a bit more uh, accessible and you can see it, and you mix it with, uh, with contrast so you can see it both in terms of a dye getting excreted and the contrast. Uh, Andreas, again, thank you. What is the best upper limit for stone size to start with? I think if somebody is starting uh, stone surgery, when I started as a trainee, I think up to one or one and a half centimeter was my cutoff. As you get better at it, I think you can push the boundaries. So to begin with, I think you should know your instrument, you should know your limits, and you should respect surgical times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I don't think you should push yourself in the beginning. With experience, of course, you can. Uh, we can treat bigger stones, and you can do more complex procedures. Again, respecting the patient's wishes and the treatment. But you know, you have op options. You have if you're really good in PCNL, I'm not going to say don't do it. If you're really good in lithotripsy, if you center, then you know. Uh, maybe that's what you need. Uh, Andreas, again, which laser machine? I think, again, I think we've covered that. Uh, could you please show again the right orientation for endopalatomy slide? Uh, we can probably, I won't show it just now, but I can tell you that in the urethra itself, in the in the mid-urethra, it's 12 o'clock, and in the left or the right kidney, in the left, it's 5 o'clock, and in the right, it's 7 o'clock in terms of incision. Do you think access sheet uh, free procedure does limit your retroscopy results? Marco, I think people are really uh, get, some people get very twitchy about using access sheet. And I know that there's been a previous paper from Prof. Raksa that showed, you know, uh, injuries with access sheet. I think if you use it carefully, personally, there's no harm in using it. I've used that in pediatric stones quite well. And the important thing is to know the limits and if you think the semi-rigid urethroscopy shows that it's a little bit tight, don't use it at all. Tamer, can you please mention the setting for dusting and pop dusting? Sure. So the dusting, we'll start with 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 uh, uh, joules and energy, energy and frequency of about 30 to 50 hertz. And at pop dusting, you would start, you just increase the energy to about between 0 0.6 and 0 0.8 and leave the same frequency. Uh, and that's your pop dusting. Uh, next one, uh, thank you for a nice presentation. Thank you, Remigius. What is your op option regarding pre-stenting? I think we've covered it. I don't think you need to pre-stent. I don't think there is any uh, necessity to do that. How often do you perform metabolic evaluation? I think, Stefan, basic metabolic evaluation, everyone should get. So calcium level, uric acid level, uh, and stone analysis. Advanced metabolic evaluation, if you read the EAU guidelines, you have some criteria for patients who are classified as high risk and they should get the full workup, the detailed evaluation. Uh, there's a, a long question from Dr. Rashid from Pakistan. Thank you for listening, Rashid. 34 year old, eight month pregnancy, 1.2 centimeter mid electric stone with pain uh, and vomiting, which options? I think she's really quite close to delivery, isn't she, Rasid? So I think in this case, if it's from the stone, I would probably stent, get the patient delivered, and then come back uh, three or four weeks after delivery because the stent then has been there for about six or seven weeks. The ureter is dilated. That may be a good option rather than doing all at one at eight months. Uh, so I think that probably would be my preference in that particular scenario. 
is the stone tree rate mainly based on plain X-ray KB uh, Geber. So Geber, in my practice, I actually use all three. If it's really, really, really opaque, then plain X-ray KB is fine. If it's really lucent or it's not quite seen, I sometimes would use both ultrasound for when it's completely radiolucent and a mixture and very occasionally a CT as well. Uh, Follow-up after uh, conservative treatment, Andreas has mentioned, uh, what about upper tract tumor? Uh, Andreas, you're absolutely right. And thank you for pointing it out. So in terms of the follow-up after conservative treatment, it is not just endoscopic follow-up. I should have covered that. It's also CT scans they need. So you do do endoscopic follow-up in terms of after treatment, but also you probably need to do a CT scan and an interval CT scan can be done at year one and then annually, but there are various protocols in our local setup. We probably would do it year one, year three, and then in between you do endoscopic surveillance. But again, it is down to the age of the patient, the preference, if they're old and frail, then you may not be as robust you know, you don't want to have as many general anesthetics, but yeah, that is a good point, Andreas. Thank you for pointing it out. There are lots of questions, guys. I'm not sure if I'll be able to cover everything. I'll probably take three more questions from the list I've got. It's a really long list, so apologies if I don't cover everything. Uh, in what circumstances would you recommend surgical treatment during pregnancy? I think my uh, re preference is to treat them conservatively if possible. If it's not possible, if the stone is causing threat to the mother or child, or if there is issues related to stent incrustation where you don't have a choice, or if the patient prefers this, especially in uh, early or mid-pregnancy, you might consider ureteroscopy because if you do stent them, there's a very long period of stent changes then that has to be carried on. Can lithotripsy be performed in pregnant women? I think, uh, Ventilla, you would see that it's an absolute contraindication, so no. Systemically stent after ureteroscopy for upper tract tumor ablation. Initially, I would. I mean, in the video I showed, it, you know, I probably went to make sure I was a little bit deep, so to avoid structures and so on, I would stent them. But that stent can come out in three to four weeks' time. And the last question, shall we say, is from Zishan from uh, India. What is the size limit for stones if you're planning for bilateral simultaneous ureteroscopy? Excellent question, Zishan. I think I always think about patient, not stones. So when patients have stones, I tell them I will treat you and not your stones. Of course, I mean, I'll treat them both. So for me, it is not an upper limit of stone size. It's what you can achieve in a, a single session of 60 to up to 90 minutes for that patient. And if you can achieve to treat, if they've got one and one centimeter and you can do it, good. If they've got one and a half and one centimeter and I think you can't do it, then do one side properly and either not go to the other side, or if you've already counseled them that you will probably do the other side as well, then you can do that. Uh, I'll probably take one last question, which is from Mo, Mo Sahu. Is nephrostomy better than stent in pregnancy due to risk of stent incrustation? Mo, I think it's really hard because they can both encrust. The problem is not what is better or what is not better. I think you tell the patient one is got change that possibly needs a GA or local anesthetic, that is the stent. Nephrostomy is usually a local anesthetic, but then there's a tube hanging on the outside and they have to manage it. So you have to tell them these are both the options. And even nephrostomy or a stent, either or has to be changed quite frequently. So that is a toss up really, whatever you do, you'll have to uh, change them quite frequently. So once again, guys, I've, there's lots more questions. I'm sorry I couldn't cover them all. But I think we've had a really good session. I re really appreciate you joining in, tuning in. I think, uh, again, I'll just show my last slide. I think ureteroscopy uh, knows no limits. That's not entirely true. It does have its limits. But I think the limits with new technology coming in, if we can measure the internal temperature, internal pressure, minimize the scope, have better lasers, then I think uh, the limits are probably more endless. Thank you very much once again to Izu, to EAU, to the team in Izu, Razan, Ton, uh, Sophia, and the team. I'm very grateful to all of you for tuning in. Thank you so much.